Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Nope. Um, okay, well, if it's not, then it's not. Good evening, everyone. I'm talking to my wife right now about the word scat. C A, I mean S C A T, and what it means. So she was discussing a book she's reading and it used the word and she didn't like the use. So that's what she was saying just now. But we're in Bible study. So good evening, everyone. Good evening, all who are going to watch live and all who will watch afterward. I pray that the Lord bless you on this week. I trust that he has increased you on this week. I trust that he's increased your knowledge of him, that he moved you from faith to faith and glory to glory, that he's continued to build you up in this most holy faith, that he's working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I trust that he did that. I trust that he's completed in the work that he started in you for this is what he promises. And so I trust he's doing that in you this week and he's blessing you this week. Good evening, uh, Mother Collins, Pastor Bowden. How are you all both doing? And anybody else who I have not recognized yet that jumped in, hello. Um, I, uh, this week, I had an interesting week and thus the title of today's lesson, uh, Boldness and Truth. Um, I don't know if you all have uh, ever watched the uh, uh, documentary, uh, American Gospel, but I watched it um, a few weeks ago, maybe a week or two ago, for the second time. I watched it maybe two years ago, but I watched it a week or two ago. Hey, Amber. Um, and uh, a few of my cousins watched it. And um, we started having a conversation about it, and it was just an interesting conversation, which brought up this topic. All right. And if you've ever never seen the documentary, I, I suggest you watch it. It's pretty good. Um, gets you thinking, all right? Which is which is always good. Gets you thinking. It talks about a lot of things that you know I talk about and that Bishop talks about, um, and some things that we don't. You know, so you might find yourself agreeing at some points and disagreeing at others, but it's good to it would be good to see just to see uh what's being said today and what's being out there hey matthew ain't seen you in a while young man how you doing um so the uh pastor shepherd hey good to see you on too god bless you brother hopefully i to talk to you again i appreciate the message um i tried to call you earlier today you're probably busy i'm gonna try to call you again because i just want to hear your voice brother that's all I want to do. I just want to hear your voice. I miss your voice. All right. So, um, boldness and truth. Yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a it's a good topic to talk about. Um, so we're gonna start off with the opening scripture. The opening scripture is uh, Acts seventeen. So if you have your Bible, we're gonna go to Acts chapter seventeen. All right. Um. And this is, we're going to read, start at verse uh, 22, okay, of Acts 17, we're going to start at verse 22. This is Paul's sermon on Mars Hill, right? So he goes into Athens, and he's in Athens, and he preaches a sermon there. And um, we're going to read that, see what he says, how Paul preaches the gospel. And how he approaches the preaching of the gospel. Acts chapter 17. Sorry. If I said Acts 2, I did not mean Acts 2. Acts chapter 17. Hello, Miss April. Sister April. Um, yeah, Acts chapter 17. Not 2. If I said Acts 2, I misspoke. Acts chapter 17. Verses 22 through 31. Amen. And so, uh, I'm going to read. And it says... Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with an inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, 
dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their inhabitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art of man's device. And at the times of his ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded all men where to repent, because he hath pointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, that by that by that man whom he hath ordained, wherefore he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Amen. We're gonna stop right there. Hey, sister Lot. Um, and so this is Paul preaching the gospel in, in an area that was hostile towards him, in an area that was not full of believers, not full of the crowd he would be accustomed to or feel comfortable with, right? This is not a crowd of believers. This is not a crowd of uh, uh, his, his, his church fellowship, right? Or the people he's usually pastoring to or preaching to. This is a crowd of unbelievers, a crowd of people who do not know him nor seen him. A crowd of people who worship a different God, who serve a different God, who actually hate the true, who actually hates the true God. Right. Why do I say they actually hate the true God? As we always say here, remind you all constantly. Right. That the carnal mind is hostile towards God it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. Therefore, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So they all fall under that being hostile towards God. They all are hostile to him. They're his enemies. They hate God. Because they hate God, they fashion for themselves their own gods. And so as they fashion for themselves their own God, Paul found himself walking through the city and seeing all kind of different graven images of the objects they worship and what they call gods. Right. And then he found one that had an empty altar said to the unknown God. Because even in their wickedness, they understood that there is a true God out there because the scripture is clear that everyone knows that God exists, but they suppress the truth. In unrighteousness, even if they speak as though God does not exist, they live as though he does. Everyone lives as though God exists because they all hold to more morality and logic and so on and so forth. You heard me speak of this before, but even if they deny it with their lips. Right. So they can deny what they want. But the scripture is true and holds true. And so, as I was just saying earlier, before I read, got to the scripture, I was having a conversation about the the documentary American Gospel with my cousins, and we got to the point of uh, some of the popular pastors that are out there today, and we got to one of the pastors that they actually like. I'm not going to mention his name here, you know, but they is a pastor that they like, and they were saying, well, you know, they they were saying that some of the pastors here, yeah, I can see that person being a false teacher because of this. I can see that person being a false teacher because of that, right? But this one here, I like this one, and because I like this one. I don't qualify him under the same categories I qualify everybody else, right? So everybody else, these people here, maybe they are, maybe they're not, but him for sure not. So my question is why? Why not him? What purpose? What, what, what qualifies somebody as a false teacher or if they're presenting a false gospel, right? What, what, what qualifies them? You know, uh, I brought to their attention, I said, you know, who? Who would you call a false teacher? They 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 name the normals with most Christians would name right Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and so on and so forth. I said, okay, fine. What makes them false? Well, and they start going to how they preach the gospel and what they preach about Jesus, right? Say Jesus was an angel, or that he's a created God, or that he's this or he's that. I'm saying, where are you getting this information from? What are you comparing this to? Well, they're comparing it to what they read in here, right? 
And here, it clearly teaches that Jesus isn't an angel. Right? Clearly. And here, it clearly teaches that Jesus was not created. Clearly. Right? And so they were saying, well, you know, since they teach these things about Jesus, obviously they're false. Right? I said, well, what if somebody's teaching? I said, so by your estimation, right? By your estimation, a person who, who will present the gospel must present a Jesus that's according to the scripture. Right? But you're not willing to say how far they must go to present according to the scripture, just as far as you're comfortable with. Because these other teachers that you said were false are false because they didn't preach according to what you are comfortable with as far as what the scripture says. Even if one, even if one of those teachers that you deem false teaches that Jesus is a God, right? They're not teaching that he is the God, Right? You know, so since he's not, they're not teaching that he is the God, you're saying, well, they can't be true because in here it says that he is the God, not just a God. It says there is no other God besides the triune God. Well, it doesn't say triune, but it says besides him, he is the only one. But clearly it also teaches that Jesus is not the Father, nor is he the Holy Spirit, but he is also still God. And so their requirement was, well, they need to at least teach that Jesus is God. That was their requirement. I said, where does it say that in the Bible? There's no command that says you must believe that Jesus is God. No, but we understand from the teachings that to present Jesus properly, you must present him as God because the apostles and the scriptures present him as such. And so this is how you must present him. And so their, their thing was, well, okay, that's, that may be true. I said, now let's go on to the gospel now. When, you, when someone presents the gospel, how can we deem it as false? Well, they're not preaching the gospel, again, according to this book. They have some teachings that are not found in here, right? But found outside, are made up. And so these, since these teachings are found outside, are made up, why won't you deem it false? Because you like the pastor. He's one of your favorite. He speaks to you. Which is really meaning he speaks to your lust, right? Because if he's not speaking to you according to this, he's speaking to you according to your lust. And so you like the way he speaks to you according to your lust. You like the way he 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 shucks and shouts and mm -hmm, yeah ah, makes you feel good, makes you get you all excited, right? Feel like you got the Holy Ghost are coming, right? I understand, I've been there. And even the pastor that they like, ah, he was at one time one of my favorites. Until I really started examining what he was saying. And I'm like. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't me. It was the Lord. Right. So rather that I start examining what he's saying. The Lord opened my eyes to the truth. And when I saw it. I saw that it wasn't according to the scripture. And so I couldn't have. He couldn't be my favorite no more. Because what he was preaching. It turned. It turned my stomach. It, it made me like, eh, it made me feel uncomfortable. Bishop knows the feeling. He's, he, we talk about it, right? It makes you just, like, you can't hear it. Sometimes when you hear false teachings, you just can't, only, you can only take so much for you. Like, okay, let me turn this off. Like, it, it's just, it's like, eh, I, okay, all right, all right. You know, you only can take so much for your time. You, you try to show grace, right? Because you're like, okay, especially if you, if you, under, if you understand the doctrine we teach here. Right? You understand they're only there because that's where the Lord has them. They can't move no further. They can't go forward or backward without them. They can't speak a word without them. So any false doctrine that they may teach, they can't speak without God giving them leave to do so. Right? And if he blinds their eyes from the truth, they're only going to teach it according to what they know. Even if their heart is wicked, even if they have wicked desires and wicked uh, aspirations behind why they're teaching such, it's because God has not given them a new heart. So in, all, in actuality, it all falls back to what God is doing. What is he doing right and that's why i taught that last time right what is the lord doing in you having the fear of the lord you know it's not understanding his sovereignty is you you have peace but you understand the fear of the lord because at any time what is he doing with you can you see it but getting back to the boldness and so we as we continue to talk we talked about an instance where 
uh, these uh, popular pastors, these mainstream pastors, they're, when they're found in different arenas than their church, then they're te televised or popular church service, right? They're found in different arenas on different talk shows where they're surrounded by unbelievers or people who who may not be believers or may not uh, agree with uh, their teaching or just God haters. They may be surrounded by God haters and not believers, right? Or not even per se believers or just people who follow them, who, who, who love them, right? And so when they're in these arenas like on Oprah or, or, or David Letterman or Larry King or any of these uh, uh, shows that are viewed by thousands of people, right? Where you get lots of publicity, right? When they're on these shows, right, their presentation leaves something to be desired, I would say, right? If at all they do present the gospel. They may not even present it. Right? They might they may not even. They may just be talking about their book. They may just, you know, be talking about their book and whatever questions is asked of them, advice or anything like that, it usually doesn't pertain to what God is going to do or what God is doing or Jesus Christ or repentance or anything like that, right? It usually pertains to how the average person can achieve their goal, fight fear, um, uh, believe in themselves, themself, push forward, how to get over a stressful day, something like that, right? Really just a, a motivational speech type thing, right? Where God is not mentioned, and if he is, it's slightly and unoffensively, right? Find, you know, find your Boaz, you know, how to find a husband or a wife, right? You know, it, and if he's mentioned, he's mentioned just slightly and unintentionally, not, you know, as if he's uh, uh, the main stream, but just a novelty on the side. If he is mentioned, most times he's not mentioned because they do not want to offend. Right. And so this 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 leads to uh, a weak gospel. And. A simp, a simp, Jesus, right? Where he's just a simp, just longing for you and wanting you, but can't can't do nothing about it, right? He 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 just a simp. He just he want to give you all the things you want just to try to woo you into believing in him. He's a simp. You're like you know those you know ladies, you know what simps are, right? You, 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 when you back in the days, or even now, or whatever, you still dating or whatnot, right? When a man was simping after you, right? He was he buying you everything and trying to do all these things to woo you in hopes that you might give him a shot, right? And so they present this simp Jesus. He's a simp. He's trying to woo you. He want he want to help you get your dreams and your car and your wife and your house. You know, he want to help you do all these things just in hopes. That after he's done all these things for you, you will, you you might choose him. You're like, you know what? You I might choose you now, Jesus. You pretty good, man. You pretty good. You done wooed me with, with the gifts. Right? So that's what they present. This sent Jesus. And so I was I was talking to them about it. And I was like, you know, this pastor, he 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 gets on there, and when he if he is cornered into a question, right? He he might not be the one to bring it up. Most times they're not. It's usually asked of them, right? A question. Is Christ the only way? They'll put them on the spot. But before they ask them that question, right, they mention them book sales, right? But the pastor's new book is, you know, right here, this, that, and the other. And I have a couple of questions for you, pastor. You know, uh, in the book, you don't, you don't really talk about Jesus that much. Or in the book, you don't really say this. Or in the book, you say that. Or in the book, blah, blah, blah. Right? And then the question comes. I wanted to know, you know, because you pastor church, do you believe, is Jesus Christ the only way? Now, I heard one say, I don't know. I heard one say that. He said, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't want to say that because, you know, I don't, I don't want to make people feel uncomfortable. 
right? Huh. And then I heard another one say, well, that's just what, what I believe. I, I believe he is. You know, I, I believe. I, I don't care what you believe. Give me the truth. It, 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 it gets ridiculous, right? See, people think that love has to be passive. They think that love has to be walked over. You got to be able to walk over it, stump on it. It can't offend. Love can't offend. But that's not true. That's not true at all. Love offends because love is the truth. And the truth offends. Right? The truth offends. The scripture says faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Right? Love offends. The answer to the question of is Christ the only way is a resounding yes. Not just because I believe it. It's because God says so. This is how God reconciles us to himself through Christ. Christ himself says that he is the only way to the father. No one comes but by him. No one. So just to say, well, this is just what I believe. That's a passive, you know, circling Jesus to the side. You know, I don't want to offend the people in the crowd and I don't want to lose my following. Right. Those who follow me because I'm going to lose my money. It may not be about money. But it may be too. I don't want to lose something. And so I don't want to offend nobody. So I'm going to say this, this is what I believe. When it doesn't matter what you believe. That doesn't matter. What matters is the truth. See, but it happens. This happens only if God gives you eyes to see. Only if he gives you ears to to hear only if he gives you in that hour the words to say by his spirit. That only way it happens. See, because none of us, none of us are that bold in and of ourselves. Don't get the high mind and don't think I'm over here with the high mind. I'm not. I'm only telling the truth. None of us are that bold in and of ourselves. In that situation, all of us would shrink back because no one likes to be under that type of pressure. No one likes to be uh, uh, scoffed at. No one likes to be hated. No one likes to be sneered at and jeered at. And, you know, no one likes that. On the inside, we want to be liked by everybody. You know. Sometimes, you know, God, he makes some of us, you know, gives us a personality where we don't care much. But even in that care much, we still have some things we care about. So in that arena, it has to be the Holy Spirit that comes upon you. But regardless, the truth is the truth. And the truth must be spoken if you're going to be a preacher or the face of Christianity. See, there are a lot of faces of Christianity out there. When I say faces of Christianity, I mean those that the world looks at as this is what Christianity is. And this is the Christian teaching because these pastors are so big. Their followings are so huge that they're seen and watched by millions and millions of people. And when they're seen and watched by this, they present this weak gospel. And so as I was talking about this with them, uh, my cousins, her and her husband, she said, you know, him not being bold in that time shows wisdom. She said he was he was being wise because in that arena, he he's he's surrounded by all kind of different people. And, you know, he could have been persecuted. And I said, hold on. You can't be serious. This is America. And there is yet to be a full-fledged Christian persecution 
in America where you're going to be killed for the name of Christ. His life was in no danger on Oprah Winfrey's show. With his security. Right. Yeah, right. His life was in no danger on Larry King's show. <laughs> on uh, whoever's show. Life ain't in no danger. So to say that he's using wisdom, well, then she was like, well, there's cancel culture. And in America, we may not have physical persecution, but we have the persecution of cancel culture where they would cancel him on medias and social media where, huh, what? How is that wisdom to try to save yourself from cancel culture? The scripture speaks against that. Jesus speaks about the epitome of wisdom in this. See, the wisdom, first of all, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, not the fear of man. So to say that he's using wisdom because he's afraid of what man might do to him is not wisdom. You can't say that that's wisdom. That's not. That may be man wisdom, our wisdom, but that's not godly wisdom. That's not wisdom. It's, it's the opposite of wisdom. Jesus says uh, in Matthew 20, 10, 28, he says, fear not them which can kill the body, but are, in, are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him, which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Right. That's wisdom to fear God, not to fear man, especially for some cancel culture, which even when she said that, it may be even more. To say, look, so are you even agreeing that he's trying to save his pockets? He's not trying to offend anybody because he don't want to lose the money. Because it's about the money. Because cancel culture would have made him lose a lot of revenue. Right? I mean, what? See, in cancel culture, basically, you know, you put somebody on social media and the whole world or the majority of those on social media or whatever, you know, will uh, block this person, stop supporting their business, get them fired or whatever. You know, if, a, if you're part of a business and you do something to somebody, right? Like during the Black Lives Matters times, like there was, it was really out there when it was really going hard, right? And you go out there and say you are non-black, right? Say you white and you do something against a black person that may be seen as racist, right? They put you on camera and they say what you said, what you did to them, and they have you on camera, and you acting all belligerent and silly in the camera, right? And you work for a business that has a reputation to uphold. They gonna fire you because they don't want to be associated with you because cancel culture. They will lose a lot of revenue or something like that, right? And so that's basically what she was saying. Cancel code. He he used wisdom because of cancel culture. What? First of all, he's a pastor of his own church. Who gonna fire him? Who gonna fire him? I mean, if he's preaching the truth, he's God's servant. God gonna fire him for preaching the truth? Like it don't cancel that don't mean nothing. That don't mean nothing at all. Right? So I was just thrown back by that. I was taken aback, like, are you serious? You know, but again, that's 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 what happens. Right. And so because we have this weak gospel and the simp Jesus. Right. And we have this these these pastors that do not want to offend when they're on. Uh, sometimes they don't want to offend on their own shows, but on other shows, especially right? they don't want to offend anybody. And they want everybody to like them, which we all want that. Right. It takes the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, moving on the inside of us to do things that are out of the ordinary, like be bold for the truth, right? Like to be bold on the, in the truth, that, that takes the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, right? But now when they go out and you preach this weak gospel, right, or you, you know, it's preached out there by them and they come up with terms, people start coming up with terms like spiritual advice, Right. You got spiritual advice now where 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 uh, it's really advice from maybe a pastor or somebody. Right. Like there's there's a segment on 
Oprah's show where she has three different people give you advice, right? A doctor, uh, like a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, and then like a, a pastor that she admires or uh, a, a, a spiritual guide that she admires. And it will be spiritual guidance, right? And this one pastor was on there one time. And he was a spiritual guidance part. He was going to give some spiritual guidance. And he was a he's a famous pastor. And so he was there and he he was it was talking about fear. And how to handle fear. And Oprah wanted to know how can uh, you help people, you know, handle fear during this pandemic. Right. And the pastor spoke and he gave some words about fear and how fear is a natural human emotion. It can be good for us, you know, because it helps us, you know, uh, stay away from danger, stay away from the edge of the cliff, you know, keeps us out of harm's way when we have fear. Right. All true things. And then he said, but it's, it's an issue when you let fear drive the car, because when fear drives the car, it can be dangerous. So you can't let fear drive the car. And so then Oprah was, you know, she, ooh, I'm loving it. Oh, yes, yes. Right? Oprah was loving it. Right? Because there's no mention of Jesus. There's no mention of God. And G Oprah openly claims that Jesus is not the only way to God. Right? Even though she also claims to believe in Jesus. And we already talked a little bit earlier, right? If the Jesus you claim to believe in ain't the Jesus of the scriptures, then you're not believing in Jesus. You made him a made up Jesus. But again, if God blinded you to that and he blinded you to the truth that you go around creating your own gods. Hope and pray that he opens your eyes to the truth, because that's the only way you're going to see it. Right. And so this passage he goes on, you know, Oprah's eating it up and then Oprah, what she does is she quotes him. She was like, you know what? I, I, I love your saying about the driving car because I remember when you said you said you, you, you said that uh, we should let faith drive the car and fear be in the back seat and the pastor chuckles and like yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's it that's it <laughs> right and she's like yeah yeah and they're agreeing with each other shaking their head laughing yeah yeah let faith drive faith faith yeah let faith drive you remember you guys hear me on here all the time talk about how in mainstream Christianity God is not the object of your faith as it's taught in the Bible, he's more of a novelty and faith is the object of your faith. You're taught to have faith in your faith, right? And so now in, 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 in this weak gospel, in this weak presentation of the gospel, in this simp Jesus that's presented, right? Faith is an unoffensive word because faith don't mean biblical faith when it's used, even by these pastors. It doesn't mean faith. Which the Bible teaches is a trust and complete dependency on God, trusting his will and not your own. As I gave you, I told you before, Jesus gives the epitome of faith when he says, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Right. So no matter if it's a good or bad outcome, what you want or what you don't want, faith is trusting God. As Job says. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Kathy spoke on Job on Sunday. Catch it if you didn't if you didn't uh, see it. Go watch it. Um, it was a good lesson on forgiveness. But um, back to it. And so he says faith because he understands and it's understood in popular culture that faith has really nothing to do with God. Because you can say the word faith and people automatically associate with it with their desires. That's what they associate faith with. So if you just say faith, have faith. Oh, you you ain't offended nobody. It's like, OK, great. Yeah, let's have faith. The, the only one you might offend is an atheist because they don't think they have faith. Right. But they do. Right. But faith. Faith is unoffensive. 
And so now the pastor, so that he doesn't offend, that he doesn't lose his following, that he doesn't uh, expose his cowardice, which is what it really is, cowardice. So that he doesn't expose his cowardice, he says faith. Let faith drive the car. So when the unbeliever hears faith, right, he doesn't associate it with God. He associates it with his desires and his wants. The universe or something like that, right? It's applicable to whatever it is he's believing in. So he can say, yes, yes, faith, let faith drive the car. That makes sense. Yes, Oprah can say, yes, yes, faith. Yes, let faith drive the car. Because it doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. And he can say faith and not lose his following of believers. Or should I say unlearned believers? Because when they hear faith, they associate it with God, but more as a means to get God to do what they want. And so they hear faith, they automatically assume he's talking about God and the Christian and Jesus Christ. They assume. That's right, Pastor Bone counterfeit. They they assume that he's talking about it. And so he's safe to say the word faith. And he can say faith and to get an applaud and amen and all that at the same time from believer and unbeliever alike. And they think. And the believer and unbeliever think they agreeing with each other on what faith means. Everybody itching ears satisfied. Everybody's itching ears satisfied. They think the unbeliever can look at the believer if they're in the crowd together and be like, yeah, amen, yeah, yeah, faith, that's right, faith. But they're talking about the same thing because they both have these wicked desires that they associate the word faith with. Where if the Lord gives you eyes to see and ears to hear, you see what he means when he says faith and understand what he means when he says faith. And it's not the faith that you have where you trust God. But that faith only comes by God. He has to open your eyes to it. See, as I was having this conversation with my cousin and her husband, I understood where they were because at one time I was there. I am no better than they. It's like you're no better than they if you understand what faith is and God has opened your eyes to his sovereignty and who he is where you fully depend on him and rely on him and see him in all things and put him before all things even when you're good or bad, even when you're in sin or you're not in sin. You're, you're looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith and all those things that God has placed you in where you can just look to him. And understand and trust him or he's you understand he's moving you and he's doing is him 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 even in all that if you think that it's at any point that you're doing something or that you're better than another then you don't even understand what you proclaim to believe you're no better than them of the same lump the Lord chose a vessel of honor one of a dishonor you're no better because what you profess to believe, if the Lord sees fit, he can take your mind, take your tongue, leave you grazing on grass in the field like he did Nebuchadnezzar. Leave you blind, can't see what's in front of you, as he did so many others. See, it's, it's God who is before all things it has to be God if it ain't him then whatever it is is what we need to serve but it is him the scriptures declare it's him right and so Can you clarify, that? clarify what um that God is the source of all things. That was the last thing I said. In, in no uncertain terms. I'm trying to shorten it down to you. God is the source of all things. You can't. Having a haughtiness. Thinking you're better than another. Right. Understanding that God is the source of all things. We, we ought to pray. 
for those we see that don't see. You know, and I'm not disqualifying anybody because salvation is of the Lord. You know, we judge nothing before the time. We wait until the Lord comes. But because though, but though because I don't judge anything does not mean I am withheld from speaking the truth. But this truth is universal. And again, it does not disqualify me as if every time I'm in an arena. I'm bold. If any time I be bold, it's because the Lord makes me bold. And if any time I be a coward, it's because the Lord handed me over to myself to show me my need for him, to keep me humble, to keep us humble. As Paul said, a messenger of Satan was given a thorn in his flesh so that he would not exalt himself above measure. So the Lord keeps us humble so we do not exalt ourselves above measure. But even in the humbleness, even while being humbled by the Lord, we speak the truth in love. And we're bold with it. As the Lord give us utterance to be bold with it. And so, you know, when we when we look at these this, these pastors and how they teach and what they present as the gospel and this weak gospel and this sissified simp Jesus who can't do anything in him of himself and this sympathized weak God sissified weak God that's presented that can't do anything for himself that needs your help and is oh woe is me woe is me help me help me help me do for you what I want to do for you please let me do it please 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 right they present a God and a gospel where they say uh Let me say, how, how would I say it? Well, they present a gospel because they believe without understanding the sovereignty of God and who God is. They believe people need to be coddled in order to come to Christ. We have to coddle you in order for you to come to Christ. And so a way of coddling you to bring you to Christ is to tell you that God loves you. And we don't present the rest of that gospel where God loves you in spite of you because you're a wicked sinner, because you have a wicked heart with wicked desires and you hate God. So in spite of you, though you be his enemy, he still loves you. And if he so chooses to, he will grant you repentance until the acknowledgement of the truth. Right. We want to coddle you and only give you the part that says God loves you so much. Oh, he's longing for you. He loves you so much and he just wants and hopes that you would just come to him and give him a chance. We coddle you in that way. And another way uh, that they're coddled is. Instead, if, without, if after the love approach, they see that's not working. If that's not working good enough for you, right? It's the God want to bless you approach. Oh, he loves you and he want to bless you. Mm -hmm. He loves you and he wants to bless you. See, with the, with the love you part, it gives people the idea that God owes them something. And so they believe that God owes them a thing because he loves them so therefore he owes them salvation he owes them salvation if he doesn't give salvation to them as far as make it their choice to come it must be my choice if he loves me he must make it my choice because he loves me and so therefore my will is sovereign and not his because he loves me and love doesn't make you do things you don't want to do God don't want robots. Beep, boop, boop, beep, boop. Right? That's the argument, right? He wants somebody to love them from their own free will. Huh? As if God needs you to love him. We just read as Paul preached 
God does not need anything. He is not served or worshipped with human hands as if he needed anything. He don't need you to love him. His love for you is not because of you. As I just said, it's in spite of you. For his own glory, his own purposes. And so in that, yes, he can make you do what you don't want to do. Because he does make you do what you don't want to do. Which is believe on him. For he has, he has to be the one to take out your stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. He has to be the one to say into the darkness that is you, let there be light. Amen. He has to be the one to say it. Amen. He has to be the one to quicken your dead body. He has to do it. If he doesn't do it, it won't be done because you definitely ain't coming to him. You love sin too much. You love it too much. That's exactly why you would not come to him. Oh, you don't love sin too much? Then why are you still sinning? Right. Right? Why are you still sinning? Because you love the sin that you do. And if not for God, you will continue to be in that sin and loving it instead of hating it when you do it, feeling sorrowful when you do it. See, it has to be God. It has to be God. Right? And then when uh, they present, after they present to you the love you got, it makes God seem uh, like he owes you something, right? Then they present the God wants to bless you, right? Making him seem like a genie, ready and waiting on you, right? To serve you at your every command waiting on you he's just a waiting and a knocking right just a waiting no it's not the God of the Bible it's not the gospel that was presented by Paul as we just read in Acts 17 Paul didn't present that type of gospel or that type of God he presented a powerful God and a gospel that uh, condemns the flesh but gives grace to those whom God chooses to give it to. It condemns, but also gives hope. He condemns said, the God who made everything is going to judge the world in righteousness. He's going to judge it. He presented, he said it straight out of his mouth. He, this is what he's going to do. But then he presents hope in Jesus Christ. Right? He presented a God that needs nothing but from his, from his own grace and mercy and love he gives men all things. But this see you compare that gospel to what is preached today. You compare that gospel to what is presented in by these pastors when they go into these arenas where they're in hostile territory as my cousin put it. He was in hostile territory. Paul was in hostile territory. Right. All the apostles were in hostile territories. Even those who would be not apostles were in hostile territories. And still, by the grace of God, by the boldness of the Holy Spirit, not in and of themselves, preached with boldness in a hostile territory. It wasn't only the apostles. See, some people, not understanding the sovereignty of God and how God operates, right? They'll try to give the apostles some type of special ability right as in they would say well those were the apostles mm -hmm. right not saying that though the apostles aren't weren't more uh, uh knowledgeable you know that god didn't reveal more unto them i'm not saying that because he did obviously they wrote the scriptures the new testament i'm not saying that i'm saying they act like that they weren't human flawed the only perfect human being to ever live was jesus christ he was 100% man, 100% God. But the apostles, they were just like you and me. More revelation, yes. But just like you and me. Sinners, wicked in heart, had wicked desires. You see firsthand, Paul, re Paul rebukes Peter, a pillar of the church. Paul does. Right? So, uh, um, 
They, they have a habit of saying, oh, well, it's the apostles. The apostles did it. You know, that was them. You know, that was that was what the apostles did. They were called, you know, they had a special assignment. They were called to that. True, but nah, that's not an excuse. Because even those who would be not apostles in hostile arenas, right. right, preach the gospel with boldness. You know, the same thing people do with apostles, today they do with pastors, right? They try to make the pastor responsibility the only one to preach the gospel. You a pastor, you got to preach the gospel. I'm not a pastor, so I ain't got to, what? What? Any believer in Christ preaches the gospel whether they know it or not. Anytime you're talking to anybody about Christ, you're preaching the gospel. It's just whether your preaching of the gospel is accurate or not. Is it according to scripture or according to what you just believe? Because what you believe don't matter. What you believe can be wrong. But this book, it's not wrong. But saying all that to say about uh, people trying to put the most on their pastors, we have examples in the scripture of Layman, as we would say today, or someone who be not an apostle, maybe a deacon or whatever he would be now, right? Preaching the gospel in, with boldness in Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, you've got an example of Stephen, the first martyr who was in a hostile territory. More hostile than any of today's pastors on Oprah Winfrey show would be in. Right? Hostile territory. Yet by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of God, giving them utterance, not in and of themselves, but by God, spoke with boldness the gospel. Stephen, he wasn't an apostle. No. No. Just a believer, someone who worked uh, in the church, was seen as the apostles as a dedicated man and a worthy man to have some type, some responsibility put on him. He was put on responsibility to serve in the church, which, you know, in today's times, uh, people like a deacon or something would do. Right. And so he goes out in hostile territory. If you want to read the whole thing, it's. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 53. I'm not going to read all 53 verses. Right? But he goes in, he starts speaking to them, and he's uh, preaching the gospel. But he's preaching the gospel to the Jews through their history so that they would have understanding. He shows through the gospel progressively how the gospel unfolds and how man reacts to God progressively. He goes through. I'm going to read a couple of verses, right? He starts off and he says, um, starting at verse two, and he said, men, brethren and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charon. And he said unto him, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I will show thee. And he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. Right. Skipping down some more, he goes into Joseph, right, and the patriarchs. And they were moved, how they were moved with envy and sent, sold Joseph into slavery. So, again, he's showing God's plan and the wickedness of man. He goes on and goes on and he's saying all these things to them. Right. They're sitting there listening. He's in hostile territory. And you get to verse. Um, 51 and he hits them hard. As we uh, as we do here with the truth. Of who they are. You know, you got to hit people with the truth of who they are. I, I said this before. Um, it's something that I think is needful. And, you know, I praise God that, you know, he's given us the ability to do it here with boldness and being comfortable in doing it without worry of uh, uh, retaliation or somebody not liking it. Because regardless, it's the truth. We tell you all the time how wicked you are. How you are nothing, how your righteousness is nothing, and how all your efforts mean nothing. The only thing that means anything is God and what he's doing. Man, if you read all that, they can tell you. Uh, yeah, how, 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 the only thing that means anything is God, what he's doing. 
It is he who works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Right? And as Paul said in the sermon we just read, right, in Acts 17, he, he, how he just said, in him we all live, move, and have our being. You, you live, move in him. And so, you know, uh, here's about Stephen about to hit them with that hard truth of who they are. Because as many of us, they think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. And so he says, starting at verse 51, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now the betrayers and murderers. You have been who has been received the law, who have received the law of the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. Now to the Jewish ear, who Stephen is the blasphemous, blasphemer, heretic, just the worst person. And in their wicked hearts and stiff neckness, they feel justified in what they're about to do to him, which is stone him to death. They feel justified because to them, what he just said was heresy. Our fathers loved the prophets. We are God's people. We love God. We, we, we do this and we do that. How dare you say this to us, right? They feel justified in this killing because he told them who they really are. And people today don't like to hear who they really are. They don't like it. That's why our message ain't popular. That's why we ain't invited on Oprah. You won't see anybody on Oprah preaching the truth of the gospel. You won't. They'll be screened beforehand saying, nope, sir, you ain't coming. Right? You, you won't see that. But you will see the sissified Jesus preached on Oprah. The simp Jesus. The weak Jesus. Where he's not really mentioned at all, just the word faith. That's what you will see. But again, I cannot stress this enough. All by God's will. It's his will. It, it, it's his. Why is God allowing this? Because he hands some over to what their itching ears desire to hear. See, the funny thing is, people want God to give them the desires of their heart. And when he does that, he gives them these type of teachers that give them this false gospel with this simp Jesus. That's what, you know, you know what a simp is. Y'all, I, I told this, I said it already. But he gives you this false gospel. And so he gives you the desires of your heart, which you don't want God to give you the desires of your heart because your heart is dreadfully wicked, Right? You want him to give you the desires of your heart when he gives you a new heart. And that new heart, guess what it desires? Him. When he gives you that new heart, you desire him. But again, he has to do this. It's not a palm request. It's not because you received him. It's not. Be no. It's because he desired to do so. Not of man who wills nor man who runs, but of God who shows mercy. So, you know, in the end, how can we be bold? How can we attest to the truth and boldness? God has to do it, and he will do it. He has a track record of doing it for all his people. For Moses all the way to the apostles. He tells Moses, I'll give you words to say. He tells Jeremiah, you will say the things I command you. And he touches his 
lips, right? He tells all his prophets that you're going to say exactly what I want you to say. And Jesus tells us through his disciples and his prophets, the Holy Spirit in that hour will give you words that your adversary can neither gain, say, nor resist. God's got to do it and he will do it because he said he will. So you ain't got to worry about it. But it's good to be able to see the differences. When you see these things being presented out there to say, oh. He's not doing he's not preaching according to the truth. Oh, I can see your cowardice. God didn't give you that boldness in this instance. I can see it. Pray for him then. You see it? Pray for him. That God pre eventually will grant him boldness to the acknowledgement of the truth. Amen. Amen. So we're going to end it right there because it's 8 o'clock. Amen. I appreciate all of you watching and listening. I pray that the lesson blessed you tonight. I pray that uh, the Lord uh, causes it to manifest itself in the deep fertile fibers of your being, as Bishop would say, right? I call. I pray that it springs forth into everlasting life, that it give, that the Lord uses it to grow your knowledge and wisdom and understanding of him. Amen. Uh, I'm going to pray us out and um, we'll end it there. Um, here we go. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace and mercy in the name of our Lord and Savior. Our King and High Priest, Jesus Christ, we glorify you, Lord, and we magnify you for your worthy of praise and worthy of your adore. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Father God, for your spirit. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are. We praise you, Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for who you are. You're the God of the universe, creator of all things in heaven and earth. You perform your own will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. Lord, we thank you for the trials and tribulations. We thank you for the lessons. We thank you for continually keeping us humble. Um, and causing your grace to be sufficient for us in all things. In Jesus' name we thank God. Amen. amen. And amen. Uh, God bless you all. Uh, I love you all. Um, and thank you. God bless. Good night. <laughs>